Hi, my name is Dr. Padilla. Today is Featured Function Friday, and we are going to be covering the function ggplot in R. If you want to visualize your data, this is one of the most powerful functions to do it, and it happens to be one of my favorite functions. So let's jump right in. All right, so the first thing you're going to want to do is load ggplot2 package, and you would do that like this. This is assuming you already have it downloaded on your machine. If you need to download the package, check out this video. Now, once we load this particular package, ggplot2, which is created by Hadley Wickham, it is going to make all of the functions available for us. And I want to walk through some of the anatomy of the ggplot2 function because it can be a little bit complicated when you start to add information in. But essentially, the base or the most simplistic aspect of the ggplot function is this here. We have ggplot, which is the name of the function, and then we have the input, and all of the input that the ggplot function requires in order to not throw an error is just data. So all you really have to do is just specify where the data is coming from, just to not throw an error. There's going to be more components that we need, but ultimately it's looking for the data and it will not throw an error if you specify where your data is. Now, in addition, the other important part is this function, and it's another function, and it is titled AES, which stands for aesthetics, and then open and close bracket, and we'll have some inputs that we can add in here as well. In particular, what we will be adding in here will be the X and Y axes. So that will really lay the foundation of where is the data and what is going to go in the X and Y axis of this particular plot. Now we haven't talked about this before, but together what's going on is ggplot has a nested set of functions. This aesthetics function, AES, is nested inside of the ggplot function. And it's really important to pay attention to this nesting structure. And really in any function, you can do a really continuous set of nesting. When you start to do that, what you will want to do is pay attention to the open and close parentheses. What's going on here is this open parenthesis for this ggplot function closes here. So it's wrapping all of this information from here to here. And it happens to contain another function, which is this aesthetics function, which is right here. But my main point is that when you're first starting out, it can be confusing because you'll see all of these lines of code. But ultimately what you want to do is to pay attention to where the functions are. And a lot of times what you're actually seeing is nested sequences of functions. And this is also where students tend to go wrong. They might write their function and write it like this. And what happens is ggplot has an open parenthesis and no close parenthesis. So it's going to keep looking in your code where to stop running that particular function. So you have to, if you have an open parenthesis, you have to have an equal number of close parentheses to finish out that particular function. In any case, this is the basics of the ggplot function with the, the nested structure. We have ggplot, we specify the data, and then a comma. And then we have this aesthetics bit where we're going to specify the X and Y axis. Now, in order to get into this aspect of actually visualizing our data, we need some data. So I have down here a little bit of code that writes a toy data set. Now, we haven't gotten into all of this yet, so go ahead and just copy and paste the code from the description. But eventually, we will cover all of the different functions within this code that creates a toy data set. Here's a link that has a little bit of more information about how to create these toy data sets. But go ahead and run that code. And what it will generate for us is a data frame, DF, over here. And if we toggle this down, it'll tell us what is actually in it. So there's three columns, value 1, value 2, and group. And each of those has 20 objects. We can actually open this up by clicking on it, and we can kind of see it in more um, graphical form. So again, we have value 1, value 2, and group. And in this group column, we have group A and group B. Now, if you're just looking at this, it's going to seem like nothing. There's no inherent patterns. So what we want to do is visualize the data to see if we can find patterns. That's ultimately our goal. We're not just visualizing for, for visualization's sake. We want to ask questions of the data. We want to find patterns in the data. 
So we have a toy data set. Let's start out with just the basics of what we need to run our first ggplot function. Here's what we had from before. We had the name ggplot, open, close bracket, and then the aesthetics. So if we translate that to our data set, we would specify data equals df, comma, and then the aesthetics. And what we're saying here is that for the x value, we want the column named value one, and for the y value, we want the column named value two. Now this is the most verbose way to write out the code. It also works like this. The majority of these functions assume that you know the order of the information that it expects. So you don't have to write it all the way out and say data equals df. It assumes that the first information that you specify is the data frame. Let's write it out the verbose way because we're just starting out. If we run this bit of code, what we have here is it gives us kind of a blank canvas. And our canvas has the y value and the x value here that we specified value, value one and value two, which is great. Now, I just, for the sake of clarity, if we don't have this aesthetics part, it will actually just give us the background canvas. It's saying, okay, I'm loading this data frame. And then when you add in the aesthetics bit, it says, okay, now that I have the kind of canvas, I know what my y and x values are going to be on that canvas, which is great. So this is a start and uh, we don't have any data plotted on this yet. So now we have to look at the next aspect of a ggplot to actually add a data encoding or a data visualization on top of this base canvas. So that is what we have here. The next part of a ggplot function in order to actually visualize something is to add a geom. What a geom is, what the geom function is, is a geometric object. That's what geom stands for. And there's many different types of geoms available to you. This is just indicating that the way you would specify the name of the geom, the function name, is geom underscore and then something. This is like not an X, but other things like point or line or bar. And there are many, many more. I'll link in the description to a cheat sheet in R that details all of the different geoms that you can specify. Now, what I want to point out is that these geometric primitives are what we call marks in data visualization. Marks are really any way of kind of indicating graphics on a page. They can be things like bars and lines or squares, any type of geometric primitive. And we'll distinguish that from something else I'll talk about in just a second. But ultimately what we want to do is we want to make a mark on this canvas up here. So we can go ahead and we'll just start, let's actually start with a point. So the way we actually add a geom to this is after that first ggplot code that we already wrote, we add a plus sign, and then we indicate which marks that we want to add on. We're going to be layering this visualization. So if I run this, you'll see that now we have dots. And these dots are the individual values in our data set, which is pretty cool. And the neat thing about ggplot is you can layer information. For example, if I wanted to add a geom line, we would add a plus sign and then add geom line below it. And then we have a line that's connecting this information. Now I wanna throw out another term, which is the grammar of graphics. Hadley Wickham wrote this particular package using the grammar of graphics. And one of the things it allows us to do is it treats creating visualizations much like you would create writing. There's these grammar or rules or conventions that dictate how we would do it. And one of the types of grammar that is associated with graphs is layers. And we can layer things on top of one another. And that is technically what's going on here, even though it doesn't look like it. For example, if I changed the size of the points to let's say three, and then I change the color of the line to red. What I'd like you to notice 
is that there appears to be a red line on top of a black dot. And what's going on here is that we have the geom line as a layer on top of the point. Essentially, with each new line of code that you're writing, you're layering information on top of another. Let me give you a physical example. So imagine that this black sheet is the canvas that we've created with the basic ggplot function. What we can start to do is we can layer information on the canvas like this. And you'll notice that from your perspective as a viewer, that this pink square seems to be on top of this white line. For you, it feels like it's closer to you as a viewer. And that is exactly what's going on here. The red line is the lowest on the code, so it appears to be closer to us, um, the viewer. And it can be a little bit confusing on, in terms of the way that it's stacked because this code is written from top down. But ultimately, it's kind of like this. So if you notice that the first thing that we added, this white line, is kind of above the pink square. And we can see it when it's written or stacked like this. But ultimately, when it's visualized, it looks like this. And of course, we can switch it around where we can start with the pink square and then add the white line on top. And it will look as if this white line is occluding or in front of the pink square. And we could do the same thing with the visualization too. The way that we would change the order is that we would start with the red line and then add this black point on top of it. And now you'll notice that you can't really tell. It seems as if maybe this black dot is in front of the line or that they're just kind of unconnected. And this is something that I think people, especially starting out, find very confusing because it may seem as if everything's on the same layer, particularly when you don't have different colors and sizes like this it might appear as if everything's on the same layer, but what is really going on is things are being layered on top of one another. So if you wanna change that sequence, you need to be sensitive to how these lines of code are stacked together. Okay, so those are marks. Those are actually making direct notations on a page. What we can also do is we can encode information within those marks. Let me show you what I mean. So here we have the plot that we've made before where we have points that are just black with no lines. Now I wanna go back to this data frame and point out to you that we have a group column with A values and B values. And when we're looking at it, the visualization like this, you can't really see the difference between those groups, right? We can't really see if there's any differences or any patterns. So what we can do is we can encode the different groups with a color, and we can visualize the different groups with an indication of color. And this would be called encoding the groups with color. And this is how you would do it. So you would specify in the aesthetics for this ggplot that you want for the color, you wanna use the group column that we have in our data set. If we run this, it gives us a default color scheme and we see groups A and B. We start to get an indication of what's going on in this data. And it can be a little hard to kind of make sense of what's going on, but we at least see that there are two different groups and each group is encoded with color. Now we can encode the groups with other things. For example, we can encode the groups with the shape. If I run this, what you'll see is that group A is a circle and group B is a triangle. This is kind of hard to see, but it can be useful if you are using both color and circles and triangles to do a dual encoding, code and go two things at once. Um, you can encode these groups with size, with texture, with blurriness, with the alpha level, really anything. And it's ultimately a way of communicating another level of data beyond the marks, which are just the actual points on the page. We're encoding the additional factor of the group, which is really cool. Okay, so I'm gonna change this back to color. And the last thing I'm going to do 
is I want to actually gain some insights. I kind of visually see some different patterns in these dots, but what you can start to do is you can add useful visual elements or geoms to help you interpret what's going on in the data. So what I've added here is a geom smooth, and I gave it the method of a linear model. Now what this geom is going to do is it's going to create a linear regression equation, and it is going to plot a line along with air bars for us to see the trends of these um, different values. So if I go ahead and run this, what we start to see here is now it's plotted a line for me, and what it is indicating is that this B group has a slight upward slope and a lot more variability than this A group, which has a slight downward slope and a lot less variability. And that makes a lot of sense because when we created this data frame, I didn't tell you about this, but we made sure that B had three times the variability that A had. So that's excellent. What we've talked about today are really just the basic things that are required to make a plot with ggplot. Now there's many other things, including themes and axes that we will cover in future videos. But the important part for this video is the things that are required include the ggplot function, specifying the data set, and making sure you have in the values that you want to plot. You don't have to do both X and Y, you can just do X or just Y for that matter. But ultimately you need to say what data that you are going to plot and on what axes. And you also need some type of geom. You need some type of geometric primitive that you are going to plot. And there's lots of different ways to arrange this information. But if you have those three things, the data, the axes, and a geom, and you will be on your way to making excellent ggplots. I hope you enjoy this brief introduction into ggplot in R. If you want to learn more about visualizing your data in R, click that subscribe button and I will see you next time.